Hello, friends. In this special summer mini-series, we invited contributors to our When I Recognized Race series to read their articles for the podcast. We hope that hearing these pieces and the voice of their authors moves you to think and pray about the unity of God's people. Thank you for listening. Grace and peace. I came late to loving my skin. I was the fairest skinned in my family, and they teased that if I stayed outside for too long, I'd become as dark as they were and never fade. So I avoided sunlight. I would bought into colorism, the idea that the lighter your skin, the better. I grew up in a military family. After short stints in Kansas and Japan, I spent my early elementary years in Michigan. My friends were mainly white and, for the most part, I felt at home with them while also knowing in a superficial way I was different. My first crush was my white neighbor and I remember my sister telling me white boys didn't like black girls. In fourth grade, we moved to Virginia. Although I could have rooted myself within a black community, being shunned by them as too culturally white to fit in deterred me. Black people accused me of being an Oreo black on the outside, but white on the inside. But I was just me, a girl who'd lived in three states and two countries by the time she was 10 and hated the sun. I felt unavoidably and painfully black. I naively thought I could accomplish my way into blending in among whites. It was less uncomfortable to be too black for my white friends than to be too white for my black ones. I was disillusioned after my boyfriend's mother called me lazy like all black people. She said this because I had an opportunity to perform at Carnegie Hall, but wasn't taking it due to a schedule conflict. He later admitted he knew she was racist and pressure from her contributed to our eventual breakup. God delivers in strange ways. Through moving to Laos after graduate school at 28, I finally learned to love my skin. Lao people are many-hued, and I found myself admiring the darker of their skin tones. Through seeing the beauty of their skin, I began to see my own. I began reckoning with the words of Malcolm X. Who taught you to hate yourself? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin? Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the sole of your feet? You should ask yourself, who taught you to hate being what God made you? I also wrestled with the words of God. He'd knit me together and I was wonderfully made. He determined the times and places I'd live. Part of the glory of heaven itself would be its diversity. God detests dishonest weights and measures in ascribing value to people as well as in commerce. Human sight was deceptive in judging each other. God gave greater honor to the parts that lacked it. We do not make ourselves beautiful the way the world does. The evidence was overwhelming. Who was I to refute my maker? One of the biggest areas I've had to learn to trust God with over the years is believing he didn't make a mistake or limit my possibilities for flourishing by making me black. He made this deliberate design choice while keeping in mind my highest good and his promise of life abundant. My blackness does not preclude me from those, but invites me to them. I had thought being black held me back, but in some ways it has given me a greater sensitivity to an awareness of the outcast, marginalized and weak. My perpetual otherness has primed me more easily for empathy, and I am a steward of the sensibilities that gift endows. I've also learned to be on alert for making assumptions of my neighbor based on the assumptions I fear they're making of me. I need to keep vigil over my own heart for unforgiveness, bitterness, or resentment just as my neighbor needs to search theirs for prejudice or unhealthy ethnic pride. In my fight for equality, I'd forgotten one thing. I would not be called to give an account for their heart, but for my own. Now, as a black Christian woman in a predominantly white denomination, the PCA, I continue to work out the implications of my race within this community to which I feel called. 
I do not take a race-blind approach to thinking about how I can serve, but rather ask how can the ways I've been formed by my experience as a Black woman uniquely benefit the Church and reflect God's character. I ponder how my own journey to find a beauty hidden in plain sight might lead me to other beauty I otherwise may have missed.